It's great to have you here um, on a rainy afternoon. I'm delighted to introduce Andreas Constantinou, Constantinou uh, who comes to us from Athens, although his company is based in London, so we're lucky to have him in the Bay Area. He is the director and founder of Vision Mobile, and he's really responsible for its strategy and growth. Uh, he's been working in the mobile industry since 2000, uh, helping take the first smartphones to market. He's worked with top brown brands in the mobile industry, including AT&T, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Intel. Wow. Over the past 10 years, he's grown Vision Mobile into a leading analyst firm in the app economy, with a client base and reputation that rivals companies many times the size. Uh, he's also got an academic life. He's an adjunct professor at Lund University in Sweden and in Athens University of Economics and Business, where he teaches in the pro former, he teaches internet business models, and in the latter, he teaches entrepreneurship. Um, and he has a gorgeous card. I recommend it. Um, with no further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to you, Andreas. Thank you. Can you hear me well to start with? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the era of developers as business model extenders, and it's a topic that we don't uh, deal with a lot we don't hear about a lot because we hear about developers as the innovators, as the change agents, as the R&D engine of companies, but we don't really understand how they help you know, the likes of Apple, Google, Microsoft, and so on become big businesses. We hear about um, a bit of you know, their involvement here and there, but we don't really understand the recipe of how they're used as business model agents. Um, this is me, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, and I have a, a couple of academic hats as well. Uh, a bit about quick introduction to Vision Mobile. We are the analysts of the developer economy, so we track developer trends on the largest scale possible, about 30,000 developers annually. I'm going to give you just a, a very thin sliver of what we do at Vision Mobile, but then we'll focus on this, um, uh, how, how, use, how developers are, are becoming business model extenders. And what we do at Vision Mobile is we do uh, reports and data subscriptions. Christina uh, is also here, who's our director of research. Um, and we also do developer experience tracking. So we track how developers are using products uh, from cloud to mobile to Internet of Things and so on. Now, um, this, uh, firstly, I'm going to, talk, to, to give you sort of the, the, the data and, and the data trends view about developers. This is stuff that you will be reading about on TechCrunch and, and so on, because this is the, the data side that people mostly talk about and understand relatively well. So um, this is actually a preview which is coming next week, so uh, you're probably the first audience to see this. This is part of our 11th State of the Developer Nation, and we release this twice a year, and we show trends uh, from our developer surveys. Uh, this is from our 10th uh, developer survey, and we, um, in this chart, we say that out of the entire developer population, 50% are developing desktop apps, 42% of professional developers actually are de uh, developing mobile apps, fewer are doing IoT, and a decent number are doing cloud and backend services. And then you see the breakdowns, so just in terms of clarity, uh, desktop apps is slightly um, or professional developers who build desktop apps slightly prefer the browser over uh, Windows, both modern and classic as their primary platform. And Android is almost at a tie with iOS in terms of primary platforms and in terms of IoT. There is a very nice balance in terms of developers who build for IoT, uh, in terms of data uh, apps, data apps, um, companion apps, and hardware. And there's lots more detail here, but I'm just giving you the highlights. And here's another cut of, of the data we're releasing next week, where you see language preference, and this is compared over a year ago. Here you see how um, HTML5 uh, and forms of um, script, JavaScript, TypeScript, ActionScript, and so on, CoffeeScript, are increasing in popularity, so the high-level languages, both on the mobile and the cloud, whereas Java itself is declining on mobile, which is quite interesting. And uh, the shorter bars are for primary usage. So there's more Android developers, so Java is the pref preferred primary language, but overall in terms of language use, it isn't. Uh, JavaScript and uh, TypeScript and CoffeeScript have come a very long way in becoming uh, 
uh, preferred languages or top languages overall. Now, this is the data side, and, and this is what stuff we, you know, you'll read about often in the press. What you don't hear about is developers as business model extenders. And th the basis of this is really how developers can be used to drive demand for business models. So let's take a look. To start with, uh, and this is uh, data from uh, a few months back, uh, we know uh, there's already thousands of apps for uh, Apple Watch and uh, Android Wear. Pebble will naturally not be able to compete uh, because of the momentum that the two brands have established on mobile. Developers are familiar with the tools. They are able to reach a very large addressable market of users, which Pebble can't guarantee, which others like Pebble can't guarantee. And so it's one market like many other markets you'll see where the leading products are defined, so survive and prevail based on the number of developers and the number of apps that are built for them. Um, same thing will happen and is already starting to happen with smart home. All of these platforms that you see here are um, platforms which are developer first or products which are developer first. Um, Nest, um, Amazon Echo, smart things, and so on. Uh, Amazon Echo is making a lot of interesting moves with uh, Alexa and voice recognition, opening up the skills for developers to build apps on top. Here's a quote from uh, Tony Fidel, which is saying that basically what will happen in the smart home is very much what happened already in mobile. That we will see a diversity of millions of apps catering to millions of user needs, and that's where developers are important in driving demand for those products. Very, very similar thing happening in the car. Um, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto have already a large roster of apps, but they are not nimble enough. So there's a catch there, because these platforms rely on the car manufacturers to install them, and so their um, rollout in the market will be slower compared to guys like Automatic, which I'm going to go deeper in, a very interesting case study, as well as others that just rely on the OBD plug, which is a, um, it's a diagnostic terminal for uh, every car pr practically launched after 96, and that allows you to tap into the, the data uh, made available by the car, and they are opening it up to developers. Uh, developers are also conquering the sky. All of these platforms, or of these products, are, are platform first. Um, they are very heavily financed. Uh, another quote from Michael Perry of DJI: um, "There's a lot of use cases that we're not going to be able to build applications and drones for, and we let others do that job because they're better at it than we are." Um, developers are. Um, in that case, the innovators, those that will extend, and that word is very important, extend the drone capabilities into photography, real estate, security, surveillance, uh, crop monitoring, you know, you name it. Um, we already see modern competitive battles won by attracting developers. I will zoom in on Apple and Google in the next slide, but other examples are Salesforce versus Oracle. Um, and Microsoft versus IBM. Now, uh, most interesting and, and sort of most folks will not be familiar with what happened pre-Android, but this gives you the 20-year story, uh, you know, from 2000 onwards. So all of these companies try to be the next Symbian or the next Android. Symbian was like a predecessor. Uh, you can, you can see them here uh, ordered by the timeline from 2000 to 2013 plus. Um, they are split into two rows. So one of the rows, the bottom row, is software platforms, platforms which were designed for handset makers, for the OEMs who were making handsets. And then the top ones are those that were designed to be extensible first, to be developer first. Those software platforms were designed to be monetized. They were selling the software, like Symbian was offered for sale, uh, for licensing uh, to each handset maker. The other guy said it's not about revenues. It's about building apps that extend the product. 
And so what you see here, all of these platforms at the bottom died. There are over 20 platforms that are just in the history books. Um, and those that survived were the first movers. And that is because platforms and the ecosystems around them, in other words, um, platforms plus the people and company constellations around them are very, uh, uh, are very quick growth machines. If you are late to market, you are at a disadvantage. You have an unfair advantage on the contrary if you're early to market. And so the two well-oiled platforms and ecosystems of Apple and Android essentially managed to grow much faster than anyone else. And eventually, no one, including Firefox OS, who recently admitted defeat, BlackBerry, of course, Windows Phone, um, Amazon, still struggling. Um, but really, it was uh, it, it, it's it's um, uh, two platforms that survived everywhere in the world except for China, um, and because they were the first movers. So both of these platforms survived because they were developer first. They understood that the point is to create a basis on top of which third parties can innovate without permission. So not just using the platforms to not make money, but augment the product, but also allowing others to do that without permission. And I can't emphasize that enough, because without permission is the key element in having innovators extend a product beyond its original design intention. Now, uh, the recipe for developer-driven business models is essentially three steps. Identify complements to your product in another market. Use developers to boost demand, so developers as the demand drivers. And bundle complements with your core business. Let me explain that, because it sounds very fuzzy and kind of hard to internalize. So I'm going to walk through three examples, um, obvious one being Apple here. Apple has the iOS platform, which connects all these different ingredients, operators, uh, brands uh, and developers, users and accessory manufacturers. And, and there's a transactional relationship with each one of them. So for example, for operators or carriers in this country, they offer users and data plans in return for subsidies. Accessory manufacturers, they offer access to users and developers in return for, for revenue share and, and accessories. Um, so this circle goes on and on and on. And it's, 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 uh, it creates network effects, so the more users, more developers, more carriers, more users, more accessory manufacturers, more users, and so on and so forth. Now, the way Apple works is, uh, what is the complement? It understands that the complement is content in mobile apps. People don't buy the phone because it's a phone, but they buy the phone because of what it can do. How do you create demand for these complements? You use developers to create a million plus apps. How do you bundle it with a core business? You allow only Apple apps to run on Apple phones. You can't run Apple apps on anything else, right? So three, um, three uh, steps to that recipe. Let me give you another example. Tencent is the leading e-commerce company. Globally, they're bigger than Amazon. Few people understand the magnitude and the velocity of Tencent. It's just amazing. Um, one of the things they do is WeChat, and WeChat is the, uh, by far the leading messaging platform, but it's not just a messaging platform. It's really an e-commerce universe. Um, Facebook's Messenger is really um, at least two years behind, maybe three years behind WeChat, uh, and it's really copying WeChat into the West. So what does WeChat do? It says, Here's a free messaging app, much like uh, WhatsApp or Viber or other platforms we know. Um, free messaging and calls in return for engagement. By the way, while you're in the app, you can also order a taxi, book a cinema, um, uh, buy physical goods, uh, even buy you know, any, um, you know, anything you can buy in a physical retail store. Uh, or a digital store, you can buy through WeChat. Uh, even gives you credits and, and loans. 
uh, even gives you insurance. There's just a, a no end to kind of the, the universe of e-commerce that WeChat extends you to. Uh, happens to kill the legacy SMS business, much like WhatsApp, right? But it's not by design. Is the operators wanted to charge for it, and then some other guys came up and said, "Oh, you know, if we offer free SMSs or free messages, people will stick to that app. And then once they stick stick to the app, then there's all other st things we can help them discover." Um, there's lots of, of interesting stuff about WeChat um, that I don't have the time to talk about, but it's definitely something you should keep an eye on. So. They really used uh, developers, in that, in that case, third party um, innovators, to build that e commerce platform. Um, so, how does, that, does the WeChat work in terms of that recipe? What is a complement to the Tencent e commerce business? It's free communication services. How do you boost demand for communication services? You offer free messaging and a third party service ecosystem. OK, they don't call it developers, but essentially third-party service providers, right? And messaging is bundled with the Tencent payment in e-commerce services. That's the bundling element. Bundling is important. Otherwise, um, there's, the, there's very low efficiency uh, for that. Another example, the automatic case. Automatic is this app for Android and iOS. It works with a dongle. You plug it in your car you get a few interesting services. Now, um, this is the product. Uh, earlier uh, in 2005, they raised some financing, uh, $24 million, from uh, two associations. One is a car service association, and the other is a car insurance association. So their business model is providing, eventually, uh, services for uh, car insurance and car services. Now, how did they boost demand for this? And how did they create demand for this? This is the automatic app. And this is the, the key use cases. So save money on gas, diagnose your engine light, never forget where you're parked, and get help in a serious crash. What they did is connected with If This and That, which is a, a popular uh, service that allows you to, to you know, plug things together, like connect automatic with all of these things, trip logging, smart home, services, location, uh, wearable social services. You can connect anything with all of these things. But it just so happens that Automatic said, well, what if we connected with IFT? So what happens on the device and in the car is shared with these other services. And within a few uh, weeks, they had over 300 apps built or recipes. But it's the same thing as apps built for all of these verticals. And it just so happens that car makers are going to conferences and saying, hey, guys, we're spending millions to build this in our labs. And you have a company that invested zero, almost, to have all these services built by external innovators, aka developers, with hardly any cost. But it's the similar, it's very, very similar apps. So when my car arrives. Uh, at work, uh, log my trip. Or when I'm going out for a weekend, uh, share my location on Facebook. You know, you can imagine all sorts of scenarios like that. But they use developers to drive demand for their product and uncover the most interesting use cases for their product. And it so happens that now they are monetizing or aiming to monetize by offering insurance and um, car services on top. So what did IFT do, or Automatic do? Integrated the app with IFT. Um, in other words, it said, what is the complement? Where connecting, the complement is connecting the dongle with social services, with trip logging services, with insurance services, and so on. How do I do that, and how do I boost demand? I actually allow users or developers to build these recipes for the dongle, for the Automatic dongle. How do I bundle it with? the core business. So the core business is initially selling the dongle and then providing services like insurance services and car services on top of that dongle. Really, you need the dongle in order to run all of this. So the bundling is by default. It's by design. So three cases of using how do you use developers to build demand for your core business. Um, 
there's a very, ni uh, very interesting and one of my favorite business models that uh, I'd like to talk about now and also link it to developers. Uh, we call this asymmetric business models and it's a way that uh, you can use to gain unfair advantage. And it actually works by crossing industries. So let's zoom out a bit. What is a business model? Uh, a business model um, is commonly accepted to be the architecture for creating, delivering, and capturing value. Now, usually creating and capturing value means, for example, if you're in the device business, it means creating devices, that's the creating value, and then selling devices, that's how you capture value, that's how you make money. And creating and capturing value works usually in the same industry. That's you know, always the case. Now, asymmetric business models work by changing the industry where value is created and value is captured. That might sound unnatural or too theoretic, but let me give you some very good examples. Uh, to start with definitions, we define an asymmetric business model as one that forces customers and profits to migrate from one industry to another. Let's see some examples. So here you have the verticals, in this case, handset, software, e-commerce, advertising, and telecoms. And on the rows, you have examples of companies, Samsung, Apple, Facebook, and Google. So what does Samsung do? It sells devices, creates value by selling devices, captures value by, uh, sorry, uh, creates value by offering devices, captures value by selling those devices for, for money. It works within the handset industry. Apple does the same, but it also offers apps, and apps um, are a complement, as we saw earlier. So apps are used to boost demand for the handset business. In other words, you don't buy an iPhone just because it's an iPhone, but what you can do with the iPhone. It's not what the phone does, but it's what you can do with a phone. What you can do with a phone is determined by apps, and they use developers to drive demand for the apps. Um, and so developers add value in the software business, but they capture value. Apple captures value in the handset business. So developers are happy creating value with their own apps, some cases monetizing, some cases not. But Apple always captures value. Whether it's a free app or a paid app, Apple will always capture value by bundling those apps with its device. The case of Facebook offers Messenger and WhatsApp. Um, which are communication services. They belong in the telecommunications vertical and captures value in advertising. Facebook is the advertising business. So it creates value in the telecoms vertical, captures value in the advertising vertical. It so happens that now Messenger is opened up uh, to third-party businesses and third-party developers probably shortly um, to uh, allow developers and businesses create apps on top of Messenger. And you might have seen articles on that, but it's very much following or replicating the WeChat business model that I was describing earlier. Google is perhaps uh, the company that has been using asymmetric business models for the longest. It's an ad business, naturally, but it has provided Android handsets, Google Play apps, Google Wallet um, facility, Google Fiber, Google uh, Fi. These are not meant to generate revenue. They create value in different industries, capture value in the ad business. So uh, Android commoditizes the handset business so that more users have smartphones and more users will be profiled by Google or even forcing other handset makers to reduce their prices, even Apple forcing Apple to reduce their prices uh, or the price range at least, therefore more Apple users will have access to Google services, therefore Google will be making more money. Google Wallet is largely understood to be a, a loss-making business so that Google can siphon, can um, uh, collect data and profile users who use Google Wallet that would otherwise not have access to. Uh, Fiber and Fire, similar initiatives, they're aimed to uh, acquire users from the telecoms business and convert them to the ad business. Um, so again, asymmetric business models are about moving customers and profits from one industry to another. Another example with Amazon here, Kindle Fire and Amazon App Store works very much like Apple and Google. 
they create value in handsets and in software, transfer the value or transfer customers acquired uh, into the e-commerce business. Zenefits is a very interesting case. Uh, it's a company that has gone under a lot of heat, particularly for that reason, because it operated as a software company while really monetizing as an insurance company, but it wasn't uh, certified or its salespeople weren't certified to be insurance sellers. And eventually the CEO had to resign, uh, but it's really an insurance company. So what Zenefits does is offer free HR software for onboarding your employees. In the US, companies have to attach benefits to their employees, a benefits package. So Zenefis says, I will help you do that. And I can be the broker. So I can bring you like who is uh, these companies and, and uh, like the insurance providers in, in your state. I'll make that easy for you to, to set up. And actually monetizes as an insurance broker. And it so happens that if you offer that software for businesses, the acquisition cost is fairly low because it's the acquisition cost of software as a service, which is generally low, compared to the acquisition cost of the insurance business. And so it's actually using a different industry, which is the software industry, to acquire users at a much lower cost and transfer those users to the insurance business. Um, similar thing is happening with uh, operators in, in Asia. Um, so they're offering free life insurance uh, in countries like India or Bangladesh, where uh, the vast majority of the population is uninsured, insurance is undifferentiated. Um, their message is basically, if you care about your family, you will insure yourself with life insurance. So if something happens to you, um, you will, you know, your family will be in safe hands. However, it says that you have free life insurance as long as you are a subscriber of the telecom operator. Right? So in that case, it's the opposite. Insurance is where you create value, and telecoms is where you capture value. So it's another way of capturing telecom subscribers by offering an insurance product. Um, some of these, so back to the topic of the discussion, of the, of the talk, some of these will use developers, some of them will not. But it's another way you can, it's another sort of interesting uh, digital business model that's becoming more and more common, which creates unfair advantage by transferring customers and profits from one industry to another. And it's actually becoming more and more common that it is blurring the boundaries across industries. So here you see uh, six different industries, comms, media, e-commerce, advertising, software, and handsets. And you see how companies from that I, um, I gave you as examples earlier are, tra are transferring value uh, from one industry to another by transferring customers and profits from an industry. And so it's becoming very hard to understand what our industry boundaries today. Moreover, it's becoming near impossible to regulate because regulation is industry specific. You cannot take pharma business regulation applied in telecoms or take software business regulation applied in advertising. You cannot do that. But these companies are years ahead of regulators. Right, so this has very far reaching implications. Now, final chapter here is developers as business model extenders. So uh, we looked at how developers can be used to create demand for Apple and Tencent and Automatic. We looked at how developers are being used in asymmetric business models to drive demand for products in one industry and transfer customers and profits to another industry. Um, these are two patterns, but there's actually far more. So um, we take the paradigm of the business model definition to actually explain that developers are used in far more ways. So again, a business model is how you create, deliver, and capture value. Now, traditionally, we have seen developers as the R&D engine. So developers who are building the apps, who are creating cool software, who are um, sort of those uh, engineers that will um, uh, be invited to a company hackathon. You know, they're the cool guys, cool girls, and so on. Um, but 
This is almost an antiquated and out of date definition of developers. Today, developers are being used in very practical ways to create value by extending products in, and, and reselling and distributing products. So three different classes of uh, business models that developers help extend. One is developers as customers. This is very classic way. So this is like IBM or Amazon or Twilio or Azure charging developers for cloud services. This is you know, very common these days. But there's a couple more interesting cases where you have developers as product extenders and partners. So Apple, Android, Facebook, Automatic, FedEx, other examples I'll, I'll give you are using developers to extend the product to new use cases, new customers, or new partnerships. I'll, I'll explain how. And secondly, and very importantly, developers as distributors, distributors and resellers, Amazon Associates, Walgreens, Twitter, they all use developers as a way to resell a product and distribute it. Again, let me give you examples. So developers as customers should go without saying, cloud providers or infrastructure as a service providers. It's a very, very common now pattern. You offer a certain amount of capability or capacity in the cloud for free. Everything on top you need to pay for as a developer or as a business. Um, more interestingly, developers as product extenders. So FedEx um, allows you to integrate the FedEx API into your business. Uh, Salesforce App Exchange allows you to build apps on top of Salesforce. So whatever Salesforce doesn't want to do or can't do in-house allows third parties to extend. Uh, build apps that connect with your business and, and add value to your business. Um, so basically, uh, you, you extend the product. The example of automatic I gave you earlier is also an example of a product extender where the recipes built around automatic allow you to extend the value of automatic to new verticals, to trip logging, to social check-ins, to um, uh, send a message to, uh, to a next of kin, and so on. More interestingly, uh, developers as distributors and resellers. So Walgreens is a great case study. Walgreens offers an API uh, to developers, which allows them to get photos printed within a Walgreens store. So this is the case. Uh, you have a photo app, and you say, oh, I have this API from Walgreens. I can get pictures printed. So the user uses the photo apps, take takes photo from their holidays, and then takes these photos and gets them printed on a Walgreens store. Now, they visit the Walgreens store. They might browse for other stuff, so Walgreens gains. Developers get a kickback because they brought a customer into Walgreens, and the user gains because they were able to print a picture from their holiday. Right? So win, win, win. And this is thanks to an API. So Walgreens says, I will, I'm not able to drive demand through my own means. I want to use third parties to drive demand for my store. How do I do that? I open an API that allows anyone without permission, without special contracts, to um, uh, get photos printed in my store. And it all happens transparently. A uh, similar thing is with, with, with mobile associates. Um, API, uh, Amazon has other stuff they call uh, the, I think they call it the replenishment service or the dash replenishment service. Um, so both function in a similar way. They allow third parties to order Amazon stock and get it delivered. So this applies the mobile associates API, applies to any app that wants to be a front end to Amazon products whether you're building a sport memorabilia app or a soccer mom app or whatever else. You just source stuff from Amazon. Amazon gives you a kickback for everything you sell. And they take care of fulfillment and everything else in payment. Uh, the Dash replenishment service works with um, things like um, coffee machines, washing machines, stuff that need off, um, to be replenished with new supplies, new uh, dispensable supplies often, and um, they've also got their own devices that do that, uh, which, is, which is called the Dash. 
Um, so another case where they use developers as a means to drive demand by simply allowing developers to be distributors and resellers, again, without permission. Um, so wrapping things up, developers are now becoming kingmakers in platform or industry after industry. In this case, this comes from our industrial, landscape, uh, industrial IoT landscape report 2015. Uh, we looked at five different verticals, and we asked developers, which platforms are you targeting? Um, this is across several thousand developers. I don't have the N number here. Uh, but these are the top platforms they, um, they go for. And all of these platforms are developer-driven or developer-first. So the key message is that, A, developers are permissionless extenders and resellers that can apply to any business model. Not just the apples and Googles of the world, really any business model, as long as you understand the recipe. Secondly, platform-first products, in other words, those that are used and designed to be extensible by third parties. Developers are software extenders, and it's a very straightforward way of extending a product uh, today, are becoming the baseline in industry after industry especially with smart home, for example, or, or with wearables, or with drones, uh, increasingly with cars. You're going to see that products without a platform-first approach are designed with a handicap. So unless you design your products to be developer or platform-first, you are designing them with a handicap. And that's the key message I want to leave you with. Um, that's my email. Uh, Michael is a strategy director who uh, is a uh, uh, co-created a lot of this material. Uh, if you want to talk to us about developers and uh, understanding developers, uh, you know where to reach us. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Um, does anyone have any questions? You too? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a master's student here. Uh, you said that the, there are regulation problems posed yeah. by the cross-border yeah. industries. I wonder if you could talk more about that. Where There isn't any precedent, really, because, OK, consider the example of Google. So they moved into the handset industry and changed things they, you know, completely upside down. They offered uh, an operating system which really disrupted Nokia, because Nokia was controlling its operating system. Uh, it, it, it had a very good hardware software integration. It was able to produce handsets out of this mode of operation or strategy very, very efficiently, much more efficiently than anyone else. So Android comes in and says, well, actually, here is a software that's free. It didn't cost them zero to make that software. So there is a case that said, well, was it the right thing to do to subsidize the Android product in order to attract users to another industry. So it was kind of a, a cross-industry subsidy. Um, you have, and, but that's historical, right? Now you have this case in, in, in industry after industry. I gave lots of examples. Insurance is going to be a case where you, know, you even have toothbrush products which are bundled with insurance. The toothbrush is subsidized because the insurance company makes money on an ongoing basis. So is the insurance business actually working within its regulatory boundaries, or it's subsidizing and destroying value in another industry when it shouldn't? So these, this, you know, these are very, uh, the very big topics that you know, I, I can confess that I, I'm, I'm not an expert. But they uh, are very difficult to regulate. You, you basically, yeah, you basically destroy value by creating asymmetric business models. You destroy value in the industry where you're creating value. You're supposedly creating value, right, by adding a product that's subsidized, like a subsidized toothbrush or a subsidized operating system or a subsidized Kindle Fire um, or a subsidized um, uh, App Store, whatever it is. 
but you're destroying value for everyone else. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Andreas. Thank you. <laughs>